religioso o l'esperienza religiosa è innanzitutto un fatto, un fenomeno obiettivo, un fatto reale, non è un'idea, innanzitutto non è un modo di sentire, non solo si tratta di un fatto, di un avvenimento, ma del fatto più imponente e più inestirpabile della storia dell'uomo. Più imponente, più vasto, che neanche il fenomeno dell'amore dell'uomo e della donna, che neanche il fenomeno del rapporto tra genitori e figli, il senso religioso è un avvenimento che pone, che afferma o che ricerca l'orizzonte entro il quale acquisti senso anche il rapporto tra l'uomo e la donna, anche il rapporto tra genitori e figli, perciò è più vasto, perfino di quelli. racconti di solidarietà e aiuto concreto, storie ricche d'amore, riscatto, coraggio e cura, storie di persone che donano e che ispirano a costruire una società inclusiva, una mano a chi sostiene, storie. Quella per farti spazio in città? What's next? O per fare spazio a nuovi amici? What's next? Quella per quando cambia il tuo lavoro. What's next? Per quando sei tu a cambiare idea. What's next? O semplicemente per guardare avanti. What's next? Vai su lisplan.com e scopri il noleggio a lungo termine più adatto a te. Lisplan. What's next? o l'esperienza religiosa è innanzitutto un fatto, un fenomeno obiettivo, un fatto reale, non è un'idea, innanzitutto non è un modo di sentire, non solo si tratta di un fatto, di un avvenimento, ma del fatto più imponente 
e più inestirpabile della storia dell'uomo più imponente più vasto che neanche il fenomeno dell'amore dell'uomo e della donna che neanche il fenomeno del rapporto tra genitori e figli perché il senso religioso è un avvenimento che pone, che afferma o che ricerca l'orizzonte entro il quale acquisti senso anche il rapporto tra l'uomo e la donna, anche il rapporto tra genitori e figli. Perciò è più vasto, perfino di quelli. racconti di solidarietà e aiuto concreto, storie ricche d'amore, riscatto, coraggio e cura, storie di persone che donano e che ispirano a costruire una società inclusiva, una mano a chi sostiene, storie. Quella per farti spazio in città? What's next? O per fare spazio a nuovi amici? What's next? Quella per quando cambia il tuo lavoro. What's next? Per quando sei tu a cambiare idea. What's next? O semplicemente per guardare avanti. What's next? Vai su lisplan.com e scopri il noleggio a lungo termine più adatto a te. Lisplan. What's next?
Buonasera a tutti, benvenuti. Good evening everybody and welcome to this uh, session tonight. So accepting the challenge of change in order to grow. And uh, we have uh, with us Gail Giraud, economist, Jesuit and the Georgetown University professor Kalim Petrini sociologist, uh, activist, and founder of Slow Food and Terra Madre, co-authors of a book, Il Gusto di Cambiare, La Transizione Ecologica come Via per la Felicità, at publisher Slow Food. Professor Vitadini will moderate the president of the Subsidiarity Foundation. So we are extremely happy to be here tonight to deal with this topic because it is uh, an extremely up-to-date topic. I mean, uh, you simply need to open up a newspaper to see to what extent it is uh, important. But then when it comes to friendships, this year's meeting topics, these leads us to the connection between man and the environment. We need to uh, somehow delve uh, into this topic because there's it is too much of a buzzword or I mean there are some controversial opinions expressed about that so we really want to talk about the relationship between men and the environment and you need a, a solid approach scientifically based considering all the involved factors the I mean ecological issue has not to do only with uh, environmental aspects and this is also the content of the Kum Tukte exhibition that you can visit in Hall A1. Just a few words that can help us better understand this challenge. So this is going to be my introduction to this session, to this exchange that we're going to have here in a second. The Key word, first key word is friendship. But Pope Francis in the Laudato Si Encyclical says that uh, so the universe is an expression of uh, the love of God. And there's always an expression in geographical space. And this is also the beginning of our exhibition Cum Tucte, because this is the first key aspect. The geographical space where we are is an expression of the love of God. And the whole universe tells us about the love of God. If we start from this assumption, I mean, we can't avoid taking care of this place, which is the creation of God. So that is why the current environmental changes go hand in hand with the Saint Francesco message. So 800 years ago, he conveyed a message that it's still up to date today not only in terms of ethical and social values uh, and in terms of sustainable development, but also as a new foundation of the relation between man and nature should be uh, based uh, on a new and fruitful alliance. The second key word I want to share with you tonight is home, house. So, this uh, planet uh, is our house. It is our home, regardless of international or local policies, regardless of individual daily behaviors. We know that natural resources are a common good, are something that is inalienable. And uh, Pope Francis, a few days ago, said that he's working on the second part of Laudato Si encyclical letter because he says, young generations have the right to get from us a beautiful and livable planet. That is why we have duties with respect to it because this is a common house and we need to preserve it. So this common house principle 
links up with the concept of community. In its original content, community means cum manus, sharing a gift. Natural resources are a commonly shared gift. That is why we need to involve people. We need to enhance local actions and society at large. In uh, such uh, individualization-oriented times, so we need to change mindset. The third key word is ecology. So a partial ecological vision focusing only on environmental aspects can have no real impact. But ecology has to do also with economic and social aspects. So human ecology is really the fundamental aspect. Ecology comes from oikos, house and logos, rational language, language, rational thinking. We need to rethink the economic and social systems based on an ecological approach. So inequalities, especially social and economic inequalities at world level, cannot go hand in hand with an ecological approach. So we need an integral approach responding fully to all men's needs. We are going through times of change. Pope Francis talked about a civilization challenge. We need to carry out a cultural mindset change facing the current changes. So man and nature should not be competitors, but they should go hand in hand. As uh, Saint Francesca, uh, Saint Francis said 800 years ago, we are at the beginning of a new historic era, the ecological transition that will last for decades, maybe for centuries. As a consequence, the key question, the decisive question is, how can we help us each other? So we need to tackle this issue. We need to mutually help each other. We need to understand which will be the new cultural foundation of this new era. In uh, the exhibition that we have brought to the meeting, the Lombardy Region Foundation for the Environment offers a proposal to answer together to this question. So I would really like to thank the high profile guests that we have here tonight and that will help us answer this question and that will help us better understand the foundation of this new era of civilization that Pope Francis showed us. So I thank you once again and I wish you a very good exchange. Thank you. Well, I had to stay home for a certain amount of time because I had just been surgically operated and I got a copy of this book, Il Gusto di Cambiare, Una Transizione Ecologica come Via per la Felicità. I got a, a copy from the publisher and the title is really interesting and uh, I really read it in a very short time. And so the questions that I'm going to ask uh, our two guests uh, who are worldly famous uh, are about uh, going through some parts of this book. So these uh, people, these two people are the Abagnale brothers uh, of, uh, I mean, this topic. So they are the Abagnale brothers of ecology and uh, probably the third unspoken author of the book is uh, Pope Francis. So really the sort of third member of this team is Pope Francis, the Helms person. And, uh, Pope Francis has announced a few days ago that he's working on the second part of the Laudato Si' and Cyclical Letter. So I will ask four questions each 
in order to get uh, short and quick answers and to have a lively debate. So I start from Caroline Pedrini. And in the book, you write, according to your experience on ecology, that the current uh, food uh, model is unsustainable for the earth. Yeah, great friends. Uh, so waste is a functional to an economic model that considers food as a low quality asset. So prices are kept low and uh, supply always uh, over achieves and demands. And at global level, we produce uh, food for 12 billion people, but we are 8 billion. So 30% uh, of food is wasted. We eat 95 kilos of meat per capita in the U.S., 130. In sub-Saharan Africa, 5 kilos. 60 kilos is the suitable quantity of meat consumption per year per capita. In the world, we're going to have a water availability reduction in the next few years by 20%. So please, can you tell us more about these alarming data? I think that it is crucial to better understand all this. So the floor is yours. Well, when I started this dialogue with Gael, I started from a better understanding of this world food system. And I have established the slow food movement and more than ever I've understood that the current world food system is not sustainable and it's almost criminal in terms of ecological transition and in terms of food system impact on climate change. I think that the food system, the current water food system, is the leading cause of that. 35% of CO2 production is due to the current world food system <coughs> production, world, world food production system, sorry. And what about uh, ships, airplanes, and mobility? So the impact of mobility is 17%. 35% of CO2 emissions is due to food production, not only in terms of production like animal farming, farming, extensive farming, processing, distribution, and consumption. 35% of the CO2 emission situation is due to the world food production system. On top of that, Another key aspect uh, about which we are aware, but that is not taken responsibly enough, uh, is the following. It's food waste. Food waste is unimaginable. The extent of the phenomenon is huge, 33% of wasted food. So in quantities, this means that every year we throw out 1.5 million tons of edible food and uh, this situation is also the cause of the very average price average low price level. So food has become a community. If we were to think about uh, quantitative terms, but also in terms of impact, uh, in order to produce 1.5 million tons of food, you have used at least 200 million hectares of uh, a good land, of um, fertile land uh, that uh, 
is used then to produce something that is doomed to be chunked off and also billions of liters of water are to be used to produce this food quantity. This situation is a shame because, uh, I mean, we can't pretend that it is not like that. And on top of that, we know that more than 900 million people on Earth are suffering from hunger, from hunger. And on top of that, we have uh, from 20 to 25 million people starving to death. Many of them are children. So if I think how little attention is paid to this by us in general. Well, I think that politics at world level should do something about this because watching in such a passive way this shame happening is irresponsible. So that was my starting assumption. And then little by little, we unfolded all the rest because this has to do with uh, what we know as primary economy. And when it comes to primary economy, well, we all have uh, a relation to food. Well, many people suffer from the lack of food, but then primary economy is something that uh, has to do with every one of us, as well as waste, waste of food. For instance, the meat consumption level is too high, and that leads to the huge CO2 emission level. When people say that these things should be changed, well, change then is presented as a sort of, you know, mortification, as if, oh, we have uh, lived such a beautiful life, but now we have uh, to change and go through mortification. But this is the wrong message. When I was younger, well, many years ago, many years ago, believe me, but I'm not talking about hundreds ago, I'm talking about 50 years ago. Italians used to eat 50 kilos of meat per capita. Now, the average meat consumption per capita in Italy is of 95 kilos per year. And believe me, the nutritional condition of Italians was great at the time. And uh, I mean, that was the case. Uh, we had an excellent situation between the end of the 50s and the beginning of the 60s. Right, then our behaviors should change and that would not mark any mortification period. Instead, that would be the start of a liberation. And Let's complete the framework, giving the floor to Professor Giroux. He has prepared a Georgetown University Environmental Justice Program. And uh, he says that, uh, well, the financial world is without rules. And so the financial support to derivatives uh, corresponds to 12 times the world GDP. And on top of that, it criticizes the GDP because the GDP is uh, inadequate uh, to analyze the world situation. And uh, Minister Giorgetti said the same thing because it's based on uh, goods consumption levels, but it doesn't consider social life, uh, the environment, uh, and uh, social conditions, uh, social inequalities. This neoclassical financial approach uh, does not consider the fact that uh, natural resources are not uh, endless. 
and also we have a lot of ground derivatives in bank financial statements that are related to fossil energy. And again, I ask you the same thing, please tell us more about these two concepts. I do apologize for my Italian, it's not perfect. I've self-learned it and I speak it through the Holy Spirit. And certainly you speak much better than many Italians. Well, I thank you for your kindness, even though it's not true. When it comes to banks, well, this is a very important issue because I think that this is the, the they are the invisible players because they do not want to do any, anything for ecological transition. When I was the head of the Development Agency of France, so before becoming a Jesuit, I experienced the fact that the European political class understood that the ecological transition is necessary. I know that there are some politicians who are climate skeptical, but I think that this is more about a strategy than about a, a conviction. And I then had the same experience with company managers. They have understood that ecological transition is the business of the future, certainly. The only sector of society that has not understood that is the banking sector. I have nothing against banks, not at all. Two years ago, I published a report in France. It's available in French and English. If we look at the first 11 banks of the Eurozone, Sao Paulo, Intesa, Deutsche Bank, BNP Paribas, and so on and so forth, we can see that they have 530 billion euros of uh, fossil assets that are directly related to fossil energy. 530 billion is not <coughs> a lot. It's uh, less than one fourth of the French GDP. But if you look at it, uh, these bank, th these represents a uh, 95 percent of the equity of the bank. So. If a bank loses 95% of its equity, it's going to go bankrupt. We saw that this year in the US with the Silicon Valley Bank. And uh, so it had lost more than 90% of its equity. That means the following. If tomorrow morning, as we should do, we decide all together that fossil energy is banned, so coal, gas, and oil, the market price of these uh, fossil assets inside uh, the financial state inside the bank will become zero after two weeks. That would generate the death of all these banks. That would be normal because that would be the consequence of uh, collectively taken decisions over 40 or 50 years. When we invest for fossil projects, we know that there are consequences on banks' accounts. So what you're going through today is the consequence of decisions of the past. But for many banks, ecological transition would mean dying, for instance, well, some people are starting to say that uh, the trans ecological transition is hard, but it's uh, the sustainable way. And so the, real th the, the truth is that everybody is afraid of generating the death of the banking system. There is a decision, maybe it's not the best one, but maybe in a couple of years time, maybe a, an officer in Brussels uh, was going to say, let's do what we did after the financial crisis of 2008 because we created a bad bank 
So for each country, you create a public bed bank that buys the fossil assets of the banks and so carries the weight of such losses. But then this uh, bad bank would be a public bank and would be turned into public bad, bad, debt. Sorry, And who would pay for that? Us. I don't think that this is a good solution, especially because there is an alternative. The alternative would be about asking, begging the European Central Bank to play the bad bank for the whole Eurozone. What would be the difference? Well, there would be that would make no difference for the banks. So again, banks would be saved and would be able to finance the Green New Deal at European level. But for us, the difference is huge because the European Central Bank can lose millions without dying because it's a central bank. It's a central bank and the central bank can somehow recreate its own equity without any cost for anybody. When I said this uh, a couple of years ago on Twitter in France, some French colleagues uh, said, oh, Mr. Giraud has understood nothing of the functioning of a bank, but fortunately, after a few months, uh, a very discreet institution in Switzerland, in uh, Basel, that is the central bank of all central banks, uh, the Bank of International Settlements, that published a report saying, well, Mr. Giraud is right. A central bank can lose billions without dying. Why? Because it's a central bank. And then after that, so some colleagues said, technically, you are right, but politically, this is impossible. And I said, why? And I was told, because if you do this to save banks, then people in Europe and in the world, especially the people in Rimini, will ask, why don't we do the same to save hospitals, to save schools, and so on and so forth? And we do not want that debate. And I said, this is an anti-democratic attitude. I mean, so it's not possible to talk within the European public space about the use of the European Central Bank equity. So what we talk in the book, what we talk about in the book is something that is totally unknown. But we need to talk about that. Otherwise, well, Ecological transition in Europe will never ever happen. Thank you, thank you, and um, we are already discovering a lot. And so, Professor Giroux, I would like to continue with you because you said there is no alternative to ecological transition. It's an, inevit an, inevit an inevitable change factor because that may lead to the green reindustrialization of Europe in a continent where industrialization is blocked. Usually people say, oh yeah, alternative energies, but then how can we generate growth? Instead, you make a connection between industrialization and alternative, uh, you know, uh, ways of development. So, well, the ecological transition has three levels. The first level is very well known, is the energy transition from uh, today's economy based uh, on fossil energy towards uh, an economy based on renewables. This is already a big challenge that is pretty well known today. The second level is much more unknown. It's the material level because in order to achieve the first level, we need more minerals than in any other normal case. For instance, we need a lot for green infrastructures, copper, for instance, copper. We need copper. We need a lot of more copper for green infrastructure than for fossil energy infrastructure. Some. Uh, Geophysicists are telling us we need to recycle in a systematic way the copper that we use because 
we will need more and more copper in the future. And copper is a critical mineral and the density of reserves of copper at the world level is pretty low. It's just 1% today. It was 5% 40 years ago, and this is a huge difference. So to do so, so we need, uh, I think, uh, a radical change of uh, the industrial approach. This is important for Italy because Italy has a strong uh, industrial heritage, and this is the opposite of the iPhone from the California. From California, we need simple products, simple to be fixed, simple to be recycled, and that do not become obsolete after two years as a, a mobile phone, because to recycle an iPhone, for instance, you need a lot of water, a lot of energy, and it is too expensive. And the same applies to electronic products. We need just the opposite. Who can do it? We can do it because there is an industrial tradition in Italy, in Germany, in Austria, and also partially in France. Why? because this is inevitable. Over the last 30 years, China has manufactured the vast majority of industrial products. But after the financial crisis of 2009, China said, it's over, it's over. Now we produce for the Chinese, and that marked a radical change of the geopolitical situation of industrial economy. China today has uh, almost a zero level sort of uh, balance of trade. That means that China is not the ultimate producer for all European products. And minerals are in China, in Africa, in the US, in Latin America, but not in Europe. We really lack minerals. That is why, in order to invent a new kind of green industry being light with a minimum impact economy, to challenge, to, to, to take up the challenges of the future. And then you have the third level, the what Carlos said about, I mean, biomass, water, and farming. And again, this is also an answer to your question, because ecological transition, transition is inevitable. As Carlos said, one third of food today is thrown away, but at the same time, we perfectly know that if we, if we want to do anything in Italy by 2040, that is not very far away, we will lack at least 40% of drinking water. If we don't do anything, so probably the Vatican won't be in Rome because without drinking water, the cardinals will not be able to work in Rome. So there is no plan B, no alternative. We need to face this challenge. So we need to reduce the amount of quantity, the amount of food that we waste. And also we need to better manage uh, drinking water, this is part of the ecological transition. This is inevitable. Carlin, I would like you to go back to the strange thing you mentioned before, that is that this transition does not require any sacrifice. Rather, it's an opportunity to feel with justice and enjoy our life. Can you expand on that? Well, this is a summary, which is also the core, the spirit of the book. A new historical stage opens up. We have to be aware of that. You know, water resources will last a few decades, maybe some centuries. But for example, we've just went out a historical stage that was called Industrial Revolution, the last two, three centuries. Humanity has never known 
levels of well-being and public health as in the last few centuries. However, there is an element that uh, was not considered in this historical stage that instead was highlighted by the Roman Club, Club, Club of Rome in the 80s, that is, the limits of development. That means that this historical stage was based on the fact that our planet resources were infinite. And we all enjoyed this condition and we benefited from that. But today, we are aware that these are finite and that this limited amount of resources is now having consequences with the loss of biodiversity or climate change. There is also a lack of the fertility of land. We are witnessing a dramatic situation. And before all this, we don't see any mobilization. We see a strong lack of politics dealing with these issues. That's really incredible. So we have to make it clear, this new historical stage opening up will require everybody to be active subjects. When Pope Francis says to implement ecological transition, is calling on us to be active agents of this change. But to be active agents of this change, one has to be well aware of its dynamics. One has to understand the enormous difficulties that we are facing. We have a huge task. And in this respect, we also have the feeling that we are late. Let's consider the climatic crisis, for example. I'm perfectly aware that we are going towards an irreversible situation. That means that while the situation had been highlighted in the Paris Conference in 2015, in fact, that initiative triggered the intervention of Laudato Si, because that was on occasion of the Paris Conference, and the Paris Conference made certain decisions, and then with the change of government and governance, in the US and in Brazil, just change everything and nothing is done. And year after year, there are these COP conferences, conferences of the parties with environmental movements, all the people mobilized, but then nothing is done. And this is really outrageous if we don't understand that this is the core issue of politics now, we are really beating around the bush the centrality of politics, the main issues in politics and policies is this. It concerns our daily life, our actions, our life, even our relational life. So we are before the need of for a profound change, and we have to be clear in this respect. This is an epoch-making change. It means that this society based on hyperliberalism is a society that is making inequalities, pain and suffering to the environment, to people, to humanity. And we have to change that. So why do we go on like this? I really appreciate the meeting. It is a sort of nice catwalk. Everybody is looking nice here, but I don't want a Ministry of the Environment just bursting into tears before a young lady, and then he does nothing. This is what we have to change. These are the things that we are experiencing, and that's the need that we have. And we must say that this is also the result of the forward-looking thought of Pope Francis in Taranto now. The initiative's been taken there is are the most important elements in the uh, civil society's policies being developed there. 
when Pope Francis came to see me, we said that this Pope is very sensitive to the people far away, but let's leave it aside. But today he's asking parishes to establish energy communities, but I have never seen mobilizations like this. At first, this kind of mobilization was taken as a vein of environmentalism where the church comes last, but those giving this interpretation were wrong. In Taranto, some indications were given that are the real politics and policies because people need to know how to behave before these problems. This kind of change can be seen as a mortification, and if this, this, if, if this is the case, nobody wants to change things. But, but in fact, we have to be aware that we will have a long historical period where we will need ecological transition, we will need dialogues among the parties, we will need debates, we need to make it possible for these things to take place, and we will witness the most formidable greenwashing operation ever seen. There are some people that have been behaving widely until not long ago, and now they have the green hats and say that they are sustainable. When you talk to anybody now, they are all sustainable. What, what does that mean? We all think that sustainable comes from the verb to sustain, to support. But then I am asked questions like, do you think that this ecological transition is sustainable with respect to economic transition? No, I don't think so, because if I keep having the old parameters of the old economy, that sense nonsense. So sustainable comes from sustain, not from supporting. The sustain is the lever that can extend the note in the piano. If I play the A key, then the sound will extend if you push that lever. Our French friends say durable, and they are right, because our actions at an individual and collective level should point to be more durable. But we have been growing up within the logic that the shorter, the more functional for the economy, so that people would keep buying and the GDP would grow. But this situation is over. But to convince that people, for people that this situation is over, we need an enormous mobilization. So opportunities like this should be used for this purpose, for God's sake. <laughs> Well, to reassure you, I can tell you that uh, Archbishop uh, from Taranto was here. He was a great protagonist in that respect, and he also talked about uh, energy communities. He was the responsible for labor in the uh, Episcopal Commission of Italy, and uh, he talked about this thing that is happening in Taranto that is the attempt to change a big steel plant into something that is ecological. So after this first part, I was also very interested in the book because Professor Giraud and Mr. Petrini addresses many other issues, not just ecology. They talk about uh, private and public goods, public and relational goods. And since we work with subsidiarity, we understand that it's an integral ecology. It's not just about the environment. It's a change of mindset, as Mr. Petrini said. It's the idea, a different idea of conceiving what is good. It's not just about the environment. And I would like you to expand on this, if possible. Yes, with Carlin in the book, we discussed this issue. It has to be an anthropological change. I think that there is an implicit anthropology today, which is sort of crazy. The Vitruvius men of Leonardo 
is uh, totally naked into uh, metaphysical, absolute metaphysical solitude before the nature with the help of geometry, with a circle and a triangle. But I'm sure the first time we saw it, we thought this is the symbol for humanity. Maybe I saw it at a high school in Paris the first time. But if we give it a second thought, if this is the symbol of humanity, we are just out of our mind because where are women? So 50% of humanity is not represented there. Where are children? Where are elderly people? And especially this adult, male adult, is a European person, maybe a French or an Italian, depends on the time when Leonardo da Vinci lived. But really, 50% of humanity is not there. So it can't represent humanity. So where is the relationship with, the, with nature? It's totally absent from that symbol. It's in, there is a conflict with this technology of a European adult totally alone fighting with nature. I have the impression, and I'm sure that Carlo agree with me, that we need a completely different anthropology. Even now the Laudato Si and Fratelli Tutti anthropology could be useful. Maybe the next encyclical also will give us a new anthropology. Maybe a relational anthropology where the most important thing is the relationship between me and nature. Carlo and I, you and I, the relationship between men and women. Because as Paul Francis said, if we're not able to respect women, we are not able to respect nature. And the same applies to the relationship between adult people and young people. If we can't respect children, that's the same with nature. And sometimes it's the very men being violent against women, against children, and against nature. So all this is interlinked. So a new type of anthropology is required. The most ancient, the biblical anthropology, where a relationship is at the center. That's why we talk about a uh, way to happiness. What is happiness? It's not consuming more and more. Consume, happiness is the quality of relationship between us and with nature. And that's the most important thing. That's uh, the sort of life. And that's what should be the criterion of happiness, the criterion of anthropological change for ecological transition. Thank you. Thank you so much. Consider some years ago with our Foundation for Subsidiarity here at the meeting, we criticized the selfishness of the individuals that with an invisible hand would bring to collective uh, well-being. But we were considered as mad because this invisible hand didn't really exist. And at last, we have great scholars talking about this. And Carly completes this with a word that really struck me, because he says, what is the subject of all this? Well, just by naming a subject is incredible, because subject is created in sociology. And Carlene talks about community. Young people's movement as the protagonist of these changes. It sounds something, it sounds like something really strange. I was a graduate in economics many, many years ago, and talking about of community is rather odd. And community in the Laudato Si is indeed present. We did one ourselves. You mentioned this to say that there must be a human subject to uh, take on these values. What do you mean? Well, we have to come to terms with the idea that there is a distance between politics and civil society, a responsible civil society. A responsible civil society is growing, stimulated by young people who are really suffering. That is why given these situations. What should happen is that politics interprets these demands and then puts into place some changes. But changes are so radical 
that if we think about that, we are all asked to go against what we have taken as religion, that is an economy based on constant growth, on the GDP, on all these quantitative parameters of well-being and of civil society. These are obsolete, but these have now been embedded into our DNA. We can't even believe that another way is possible. And that's not all. As soon as somebody comes up with some idea, they are accused as visionaries, as people out of the world that are not really practical. And uh, I am really sorry that at present there are two fundamental, fundamental issues for humanity. On the one hand, the change in the relationship between man and nature, and on the other hand, the right for peace. Well, Pope Francis is a voice, is a cry in the desert, because we can see that he has the ability to call one and a half million young people and that his message has an impact. But this impact is with respect to the solid religion of the economy that has unmovable, unmovable principles. It becomes like a utopia, something that cannot really be pursued. Since, since this is the present situation, on the one hand, we have really to state that the situation is dramatic. We have to be frank and that we're going towards an irreversible situation. So our initiatives will turn into containment initiatives, will not be resolution-based initiatives, not to solve. On the other hand, we have to be aware that we have to create a new political subject, and this new political subject must be spread as much as possible. We have to be aware that uh, in the West, in our Europe, historically, the greatest revolution that, have, that ever took place, took place in the Middle Ages when the Benedicts changed the European agriculture. European agriculture was born out of this uh, work of community. Uh, they restored wetlands, they managed the fields. That's a real revolution. And what, what the distinguishing feature of that revolution, they were communities within which there were precise rules. One is even astonished when reading these rules written by a saint when this reality is created, the saint had died already three centuries before, and now these rules are still so topical, so present. But are we aware of our history, really? So I think that uh, the situation of implementing forms of communities that can have a kind of autonomy and that are not subject to hierarchical control and that can express their diversity is really important. When we read the Laudato Si, this division between believers and non-believers doesn't make sense. Here, the world is uh, being destroyed uh, and we are still wondering whether you are or not a believer. That doesn't matter because we have to be practical we have to be concrete. So in my view, this is the new frontier of new politics. This is the new frontier of new politics, which requires a spread subject in the civil society embracing this approach to biodiverse communities that have they have to be sufficiently anarchical to interpret their territory. As Italians, 
we can't propose a solution to our African brothers. Our African brothers must have solutions there where they live. And this is uh, an approach to mobilization that can be one of the hopes. Will it be successful? Maybe not. But tell me what alternative might be there. Because if the alternative is just to wait and see and wait for a new kind of subject, just presenting these issues to the benefit of the civil society, well, we are looking forward to it, but it's not there today. Even if you listen to politicians, politicians are talking about people, are talking about things that the people can't even understand. They cannot be understood. So we are entering a stage where civil society now must fully express some forms of gratification because this is a form of gratification and that they become an active political subject. This is the beauty that has even uh, pushed some charismatic people. There are some people that believed in certain things, and these were forward-looking people, because if they started to work in politics, they could have done nothing. So the only hope today is to have a spread forward-looking attitude to be able to interpret this change. That's what we need, a civil society that becomes a political subject. And even if they don't form a rigorous political subject, that's not a problem. But the people must really start doing something, otherwise, mala tempora. Uh, Well, what I really like the, about this debate is that, uh, well, everything seems so link up, links up. Well, I have a last question. So, I now understand why Pope Francis, uh, I mean, uh, has become so attached to you. Well, I've always considered you as a master, so I would like you to end up on... Uh, a source of uh, deeper explanation of what you see about uh, the encyclical letters of Pope Francis and uh, his pathway. You said to me once, he's the only great man together with the people from the left who is uh, understanding this and is trying to fight a war for this. Well, not to fight a war, but to struggle for this, sorry. Well, First of all, we need to have a historic perspective. I need that in August 2016, I was here, I was here. And the, the room was as full as tonight. And then at one point I asked the people, who among you read the Laudato Si? There were four priests and two uh, bishops who said, Yes, we read it, but they were the only ones. But, well, for them, it's almost a professional duty. Nobody else read it. The thing is that this document is incredible. It is so important. It was not understood neither from Catholics nor from laymen because, I mean, it was so misunderstood. And nobody had understood that this topic was strictly related to spirituality. Then I had a dialogue with Pope Francis, and he told me very honestly, I was in the very same situation. I remember I used to attend the, the bishops meeting in Latin America, and there were were talking about the environment in 2007, and I thought, well, we are here to talk about different things. Why do we talk about uh, social ecology and uh, environmental issues? And again, so I must say that another key thing is that
what he did is also a very important testimony. We are entering a very incredible historic phase. Next year, we're going to celebrate 800 years of uh, St. Francis' uh, work of art. And uh, so we are approaching very important years. Our civil society should consider these celebrations as very important because, uh, I mean, uh, there is so much still in uh, St. Francis' words. I mean, we should consider is a canticle of creatures as uh, the canticle of the sun is a key uh, piece of work because it's about, uh, I mean, topics that are still up to date. And I say it as layman. Well, the Pope said that uh, I am a pious agnostic because uh, I feel uh, pietas for NATO. Okay, so I'm agnostic. Okay, I accept it. But what I want to say is that we are faced with the lack of uh, vision. We lack visionary people, but the canticle of creatures is the most visionary work ever because it's a sort of precursor of brother all and uh, politicians will never reach that. Instead, the new generations really want to hear this. They want to hear that in order to put that into practice. You are without any bearings. We need to develop this sensitivity to fully understand the historic phase we are going through. On top of that, I'm almost very much worried by the solitude of this man. He's so lonely. There is no movement supporting him in this, but in Piedmont region we have a saying that is, our Lord pays later, but then pays abundantly. So I'm sure that uh, the visionary nature of this man will be politically acknowledged because now, I mean, there is no real debate living up to that. Europe is uh, somehow closed. But are we aware of the fact that the FAO is telling us clearly that climate change will generate migrant flows of more than 200 million people? And we discuss with the Tunisians for, I mean, a little bit more money. You should be aware of the fact that things are changing. And then what happens? Oh, well, no political party cares at all. Neither the right nor the left parties. They don't care, simply. We somehow are faced with a sort of accepted genocide because so many people dying under our eyes should generate some reactions. But no, it's okay for everybody. We should get so angry, so angry for this. We should talk more, do more. And civil society should understand this because if civil society does, uh, doesn't understand this, we should uh, consider that then the pain and the suffering generated by the environment will somehow fall on us. So a sick environment somehow reacts badly on us. 
Secondly, we need to take our full responsibility. Then we need a, a strong mobilization. We are faced with a historic moment. We need to take action. We need to do something. It's very hard. But if we really care for our planet, we need to get together and do something. We need to carry out practical changes that can really lead to real changes of the status quo. I hope that your words will be heard because now we have many, many people following us on streams and uh, there are certainly many people listening to you. So, Professor Giroud, you're a Jesuit. I'm asking you something that is complimentary. You have extended somehow the church's social doctrine because usually these topics were absent from the church social doctrine. So being you a Jesuit, what is your vision? I mean, what do you think about this? I mean, some years ago, I've always been a pretty green and I was told, no, we should think about man and not about nature. But for the very first time, the two things are going hand in hand. So what is this new conception about? So I want to tell how I came across him. So the very, the, the, the term ecological transition was invented by him in 2014. And I remember meeting him at a debate in Bergamo. The pandemic was still rife. I remember him taking the floor and say, saying, this neoliberal system needs to be torn down as during the French Revolution that tore down the king. And I said, who is this man? He's a Jesuit. He's a Jesuit. I need to get to know him. So we got in touch, and the thing that really fascinates me about his thinking is that the things that he says are real, are true, and are feasible. If we leave behind a certain religious approach, and we try to be more open. What he says is not absurd at all. And that is how this friendship uh, saw the day. And uh, I'm really so impressed by his force and determination. And so, well, I need to say what happened next. After this conference in Bergamo, he told me, we need to write a book together. And I said, no, I don't have the time. I am too busy. And he told me, no, no, no. We will go somewhere together in the most beautiful place. Three days, we will eat wonderfully. We will talk. And Stefano Arduini is going to record everything and then write it down. And then I said, yes. Well, next time, may I join you? But in order to answer to you about uh, the tradition of the church, I don't think that uh, the Brother All is such uh, a new event uh, in the history of the church. No, I think that this is part of the church tradition in the broadest sense. The issue of common goods uh, is uh, already in the New Testament, in uh, the Bible. So let's say that the church was about sharing. And so the apostles shared everything, and everything was written three times in order to understand that common goods are not an easy option. 
but they are the laying foundation for a Christian way of living. So this is the biggest and longest church tradition. Secondly, if we think about uh, what Christ did during the Eucharist, and his body was a common good for everybody to give life to everybody. It was not something private. It was not a res privata, something private. Instead, it was, it was not even of the state. It was not belonging to a tribe. It's something for everybody. And uh, something that Christ shared for everybody. And this is the first and most fundamental common good of our life. I hope that the people following this session have seized the value of this exchange. What has been said here is of a revolutionary nature. It lays the foundation for a radical change. And this place is so important, it's so precious. At the meeting, people can talk and discuss and exchange uh, opinions and uh, come up with uh, these kinds of ideas. Extremely valuable things have been said, and I think that everybody will retain what struck them the most. Well, I think that our guests uh, helped us better understanding the notion of uh, integral ecology, integrated ecology, because this has to do with man as a whole. It has to do with farming, with business, with industry. In the Kung Tuk exhibition, we have a, a beautiful picture made by the Academia di Brega students reproducing the traditional world plan, but in a disproportionate, intentional way. So countries are, the countries have the size equaling the quantity of CO2 emissions that they generate. So the biggest countries are the industrialized ones. So it goes without saying to what extent the Greenhouse gases uh, emission levels is strictly connected to economies and rich countries, poor countries. The poor countries are the most affected by the consequences of such climate change, but they are the smallest producers of these uh, emissions. So again, Pope Francis is very clear when he talks about integral ecology. And also tonight, uh, we had a clear proof of the fact that we are faced with a new era. And um, we are going through a radical period of change that could be compared to the Industrial Revolution. Maybe in a couple of centuries' time, well, this period will be remembered as uh, the Ecological Transition Revolution. So we have such a great responsibility. And uh, beyond the durability, beyond many things, maybe the biggest issue ever is the meaning. What's the meaning of this revolution? And so I'm happy that uh, we finished this discussion with a reference to the encyclical letter and uh, with the announcement of the current uh, work of uh, a new encyclical letter, the continuation of the, of the Laudato Si. So we need to be aware of the fact that we're going through change. The Pope understood it. So there is a place 
difficult to find the meaning of this. And so I thank these guys for helping us better understand the extent of this change. Thank you. So we talked about friendship and uh, friendship has always been one of the highest manifestations of human relations. Support and love become mutual. Mating is the result of a friendship and relies on uh, human relations. So please uh, do not hesitate to donate at the specific Dona Ora desks with the red heart. Another important thing is that the Mating Foundation is an entity of the third sector, and if you will support the meeting, you will be able to access tax breaks. Thank you very much, and uh, have a nice evening. Thank you. Volevo dirle che io sono un membro. Da un'idea di Giorgio Vittadini, un laboratorio di ricerca, formazione, divulgazione per promuovere la cultura della sussidiarietà, motore di democrazia e sviluppo sostenibile. Fondazione per la sussidiarietà, da vent'anni, un network che crea consapevolezza e partecipazione per il bene comune. religioso o l'esperienza religiosa è innanzitutto un fatto, un fenomeno obiettivo, un fatto reale, non è un'idea, innanzitutto non è un modo di sentire, non solo si tratta di un fatto, di un avvenimento, ma del fatto più imponente e più inestirpabile della storia dell'uomo. Più imponente, più vasto, che neanche il fenomeno dell'amore dell'uomo e della donna, che neanche il fenomeno del rapporto tra genitori e figli. Perché il senso religioso è un avvenimento che pone, che afferma o che ricerca l'orizzonte entro il quale acquisti senso anche il rapporto tra l'uomo e la donna, anche il rapporto tra genitori e figli. Perciò è più vasto, perfino di quelli.
10 racconti di solidarietà e aiuto concreto. Storie ricche d'amore, riscatto, coraggio e cura. Storie di persone che donano e che ispirano a costruire una società inclusiva. Una mano a chi sostiene. Storie. Quella per farti spazio in città? What's next? O per fare spazio a nuovi amici? What's next? Quella per quando cambia il tuo lavoro? What's next? Per quando sei tu a cambiare idea? What's next? O semplicemente per guardare avanti? What's next? Vai su lisplan.com e scopri il noleggio a lungo termine più adatto a te. Lisplan. What's next?